Hello, I'm Jay Norton, Soils Extension Specialist with the University of Wyoming Department of Ecosystem Sciences and Management. Today I'm going to talk about uh, urea volatilization mainly um, as, and of how to avoid it as a way to save money, save fertilizer, protect the environment, and increase yields because more nitrogen gets to the crop where you want it. Uh, quickly, the, I'm going to go over the nitrogen cycle and some loss pathways. I'm going to talk about uh, sources of nitrogen and their potential for loss. I'm going to talk mainly about ammonia volatilization and uh, management guidelines that minimize losses. Um, so, when we talk about... Uh, let me get my pen here. This is a complicated version of the nitrogen cycle, but it is, it's a complicated nutrient cycle, probably the most complicated one of the, of the nutrients that um, are essential for crop growth. Um, essentially what we want to see happen is kind of an internal nitrogen cycle. Uh, crop uptake occurs from this, the, these soluble forms, nitrate and ammonia, I mean, nitrate and ammonium in, the, in uh, the soil solution. So it takes water and soluble nitrate uh, nutrients for plants to take up. Those come from uh, several different sources and they're taken up by uh, microbes in the, in the soil organic matter pool. They then that uh, mineralizes to become ammonia and nitrate, and that goes into the soil solution. Then it can be re-immobilized by soil microbes and conserved that way, and, and we have this internal nitrogen cycle. And of course, we want it to be taken up by, um, by plants, and then those residues go back into the pool. So ideally, we get a, a cycle like that. Now, um, let me see if I can... What we're going to talk about mainly today is fertilizer inputs. So shortcutting that and putting fertilizer directly into the available nitrogen pool. Um, and from there, it can either be taken up by our crops, which means we're in the black, we make money. Uh, it can go to our, you know, and other, other ways out of that cycle I was talking about is it can be volatilized. Ammonium can be volatilized to the gas, ammonia, and lost to the atmosphere. Uh, it can also, nitrate can be lost via leaching or denitrification. In Wyoming, with our conditions, uh, ammonia volatilization is probably the m more important loss pathway. So I'm going to focus on those, given the time we have. So those are those represent big money losses. And... Uh, ammonia is also a, a creator of smog. It's, it's one of the drivers of smog along the front range, for example. Um, denitrification cause, uh, emits nitrous oxide, N2O, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. So these are not only losses of money to producers, but they're, they're important um, environmental degradation factors. So ammonium can be lost through volatilization. It can be fixed to, to uh, soil particles and then eroded away, and it can be nitrified through this process to, um, to, to become nitrate and then lost through denitrification and leaching. So we're going to focus mainly on, on the volatilization pathway today. Let me... Uh... Um, so the types of end fertilizer, the, uh, the Haber-Bosch end fixation process was developed after World War II or during World War II to make bombs and then, um, you know, became an important, very important chemical reaction for industrial production of fertilizer. And the ultimate product there, uh, it takes, you know, high heat, high pressure and uh, in the presence of a catalyst 
to pull nitro dinitrogen gas out of the air, which is a, an inert gas, combined with hydrogen from from natural gas. So it's very consumptive of natural gas and and very um, a high producer of carbon dioxide. It's one of the uh, industrial chemical reactions that produces the most carbon dioxide. But the ultimate product is ammonia, which is a gas, um, and all these other forms of fertilizers are made from those. And, and in a lot of the places, in a lot of crop production areas, ammonia is injected straight into the ground as a gas, and you know that has a lot of hazards. It's a hazardous material to work with, um, and it can be lost. Uh, you know. Careful management is necessary, but it's it's the highest analysis. It has the, it contains the most actual nitrogen of these other forms. Um, not so much of that is used in Wyoming. I think mainly because of our our higher pH soils that that uh, contribute to more loss um, of that. And I'll I'll, talk, I'll be talking about that. So then there's these other forms. Um, the main the main ones I'm going to talk about are the ones that are used in Wyoming. Uh, ammonium phosphate, these are common phosphorus fertilizers that also contain nitrogen as ammonium. So volatilization occurs with those two. The most common ones used in Wyoming, I, I think, are uh, ammonium sulfate, urea. Urea is probably the most common dry fertilizer used all over the world because it's got a relatively high analysis, 46% nitrogen and it's easy to ship and easy to work with, relatively so. But we'll see, I'll be talking about the disadvantage. And then UAN, either 28 or 32 percent nitrogen, is a, another common liquid form of, of nitrogen fertilizer. So ammonia volatilization occurs with any ammonia or ammonium-based fertilizer. So all of those, really. Um, <clears throat> high pH or a high hydroxyl concentration increases volatilization. So most of our soils are alkaline, pH above 7, so that's going to drive more volatilization from Wyoming soils right there. Um, it happens when uh, we get ammonium plus hydroxyl ions from which occur in higher pH above 7 and creating ammonia gas and water. So the ammonia gas is, is lost to the atmosphere, and that's ammonia volatilization. Um, other, the other loss pathways are denitrification, which occurs mostly in saturated soils or in saturated microsites, but also as a, as a result of the nitrification process from ammonium to nitrate. Um, significant losses occur when too much uh, nitrogen is applied. So we get a lot of uh, nitrification, which leads to a lot of um, uh, nitrate, and denitrification occurs when that sits there and is exposed to anoxic conditions or saturated conditions, even in, in microsites, not necessarily in ponded conditions. Leaching isn't so important in, um, is it is important in the West, where we get less than about 17 centimeters of rain than it is in the Midwest and the East where where water from rain actually moves below the rooting zone. Uh, in the West, except in the mountains, water typically doesn't penetrate that far unless we're over irrigating. So over application of both fertilizer and water can lead to leaching. But I'm not, that's all I'm going to say about those processes right now. So Comparing these different products and the potential volatilization loss, comparing those with the urea, because urea is really the, the worst uh, as far as potential volatilization. Um, ammonium nitrate or ammonium sulfate is the main one, has lower potential volatilization. UAN has lower volatilization potential. And then if you use agritain or this MBPT, urease inhibitor, and I'll talk about what that means, that reduces volatilization. Um, other kinds of, of soil conditioners or, or products you mix with the fertilizer 
controlled release fertilizers like coated polymer coated fertilizers are, are meant to uh, slow down the release and reduce volatilization and losses. So urea volatilization, if we're not careful, uh, we can lose half or more of fertilizer that's applied, of nitrogen fertilizer that's applied to volatilization. Um, urea, this is a formula for urea. It's, it's, it's not an ammonia-based fertilizer. So why are we talking about urea? Why is it bad? Well, it's also not plant available in this form. It's a synthetic fertilizer made by the processes we talk, talked about, but it, um, it's a synthetic, simple organic molecule when you put it on the soil. So it has to be um, hydrolyzed to form ammonium before plants can take it up. And there's two stages for this. First, urea plus water yields ammonium plus uh, carbonate. Um, and that carbonate mixes with water and creates these hydroxyls. So it, it consumes hydrogen ions and, and creates hydroxyl ions, both of which increase the pH in the soil right around that, sorry, right around that prill especially. We can get drastic increases of pH right around that prill. And uh, it's temporary, but it, it, it drives volatilization. So those hydroxyl ions are going to drive off that ammonium, convert that ammonium to am ammonia gas, which is lost to the atmosphere. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. And that hydrolysis of urea is increasing pH temporarily in that microsite is what really makes urea high risk for volatilization more so than the other products. So what are those right conditions? Moisture is a is one of the most important factors. A little bit but not a lot is necessary for these reactions. Um, and if, if we have wet conditions the, the ammonium is going to stay in solution and be available for for that process of volatilization. Wind is a is a driver of volatilization. Alkaline soils, so strike one against Wyoming, strike two, right? Wind and a little moisture, but not a lot. Those are all Wyoming conditions. <clears throat> temperature, higher soil temperatures re, uh, increase reaction rates. Or putting the the soil the fertilizer on frozen soils has been found to uh, keep the fertilizer on the surface. And they've done a lot of work on that in Montana because we thought that applying urea to co under cold conditions, it would just sit there, but it doesn't. A lot is lost. And um, incidentally, I owe a lot of this presentation to my colleague, Clayne, Join Clayne Jones at Montana State University. And him and his colleague, Rick Engel, have done a lot of work on this. Surface residues, so no-till or minimum till conditions or sod or pasture conditions with with plant materials on the surface that that material harbors the urease enzyme which is necessary to drive that uh, hydrolysis reaction of of your of uh, urea so low buffering or cation exchange capacity um, with low cation exchange capacity that ammonium stays in solution. It's a cation, so it has a tendency to be absorbed to cation exchange sites, negative, uh, negative, uh, negatively charged particles, <clears throat> which holds it and exchanges it, makes it slowly available for plant uptake. Um, but without, with a low cation exchange capacity, it'll stay in solution and spend a longer time being uh, vulnerable to volatilization. What's, what's uh, a soil property that drives higher um, cation exchange capacity or, or this ability to absorb and release nutrients? Well, clay, the types of clays we have in Wyoming have a good cation exchange capacity, but another substance that has a very high cation exchange capacity and is really affected by management is soil organic matter, so, which is also an important indicator of soil health. So, Soil health management to increase soil organic matter 
is going to be one of the things that reduces volatilization potential of uh, urea fertilizers. And also time. The longer time between application and plant uptake, the longer that material sits there, the more time there is for these reactions and losses, even at low temperatures. So there's a lot of factors that make this really hard to predict. Um, but, it, but really, as I'll talk about, not that hard to prevent with some short and long-term management. So I'm going to talk about each of these factors a little more. Um, data from this study and, and a lot of others show that, you know, the, uh, the loss, this is a loss of applied N, you know, up to 30% of applied N can be lost if, if uh, soil moisture is over 30% or so. Um, 20 to 23 percent, that's about field capacity, so you, you really don't want it to be much wetter than field capacity at that surface. Um, so if you apply it and it rains a little bit, that's going to be a big problem. Um, the worst case is broadcasting on a moist surface and it's followed by, you know, light scattered precipitation. This this is that study in Montana where they, they devised these um, these instruments to capture ammonia and in just six days they lost 10 percent even under these obviously chilly conditions so rainfall irrigation uh, you you don't want to apply urea to the surface unless you can get it below the surface <clears throat> And one way to do that is irrigation. Irrigating, irrigating a half an inch or more will move that at least two inches below the soil surface and really reduce volatilization losses. Um, a quarter inch or less will dissolve the fertilizer and then drive those reactions that, that cause loss of uh, N as, as ammonia. So wind, if, it, if it's going to be windy, just you know, wait until for a calmer day because wind will really drive that ammonia loss fat, uh, rapidly. <clears throat> Soil pH and temperature combined. So here we have two different temperatures, 35 degrees and 77 degrees across the range of pHs in, in an experiment. And um, the amount of ammonia generated is what this shows. Uh, increases drastically when you get above pH 8, which is where a lot of our agricultural soils are, are um, over pH 8 somewhere, below 9 but above 8. But the, the other factor is that, as we talked about, urea hydrolysis increases pH in that zone around that prill and, and can, can increase it drastically. So even at low temperatures, you can get up, you know, in pH nine or ten temporarily around that prill which is going to drive volatilization stubble so if you're if you're doing no-till you got to get it below the stubble um, residues on the surface even if you try to water it in it's going to absorb a lot of the water make it hard to, to move that material into the soil um, the residues have a higher pH so that's going to drive more volatilization uh, and uh, the residues harbor the, ure the urease enzyme, which is necessary for hydrolysis of urea, which then releases the ammonium, which is vulnerable to uh, loss as ammonia. Uh, just broadcasting urea on the surface will get twice the, uh, the volatilization that we do with con conventional tillage. Cation exchange capacity. So this is something we have control over. Soil health management practices to conserve or increase soil organic matter content. If you know me, you've heard me talk about this until you're probably tired of it. But I'm going to keep talking about it. Um, so here we, we have uh, organic carbon, or I put this soil organic matter content below here, and the cation exchange capacity, or the amount of new, positively charged nutrients, including ammonium, that that soil can hold and release uh, increases drastically. So this is a very important soil property. And uh, we're, most of our soils are in the 
area of two or less percent organic matter, but you can see if we can get it up to to two, we we um, we can double the cation exchange capacity, which is going to lower the risk of volatilization. Now here's a here's a twist. High um, high soil calcium content can decrease urea volatilization. So instead of um, this two-step reaction here, when we have uh, soluble dissolved calcium in the soil water, if we get urea plus water plus calcium, we get this reaction instead. So we don't have that free carbonate ion that's going to generate hydroxyl and, and increase the pH. Instead, the calcium combines with that carbonate ion to form calcium carbonate and uh, protecting, uh, reducing that in pH increase and um, slowing volatilization. So um, the other thing that's going to do is um, free up a, a site on the cation exchange for absorption of that, that ammonium cation. And, but the thing is, um, you know, so it is something positive about our calcareous soils that we like to, to complain about because they bind phosphorus and, and they turn hard as cement when they dry out. But this is something positive about the high calcium in our soils. But the catch is you got to get the urea in the soil for that reaction to take place with calcium. So there again, it has to get into the soil. Um, this, that research in Montana, they found anywhere from 3 to 44% of urea that was put on in the fall and winter was lost to volatilization. So the, the, the idea that you can put it on in cold conditions and just let it sit there is a myth. A lot of it's going to be uh, lost. And here we see N, nitrogen, and dollars you know, flying away. <clears throat> So the other fertilizer, ammonium sulfate, has a lower volatilization rate, but in calcareous soils, now back again to disadvantage, uh, it can be higher because um, this isn't a balanced equation, but that uh, sulfate is going to combine with the calcium and calcium carbonate, freeing up that carbonate ion to generate hydroxyl and, and increase the pH. So we, we end up with some gypsum, some ammonium, and an increase in pH. Okay, so the liquid form, urea ammonium nitrate, 28 or 32 percent nitrogen, that's very commonly used in, in Wyoming. We, it, it, the volatilization risk is less, but it's still significant under those right conditions. Part of the reason it's less is a quarter of that nit nitrogen in that substance is, is nitrate, which doesn't um, volatilize, but it can be lost through through leaching and denitrification, as I talked about. Um, so the the both urea and UAN are going to require and ammonium sulfate are going to require proper management to avoid volatilization. So really, you want to consider the price and the kind of equipment and other um, considerations maybe more so than volatilization risk because you're going to have to do the right kind of management to minimize those losses no matter what. Um, so getting it below the soil, this just shows some data with irrigation. If we get up to that half inch, it, the, the percent of applied N that's lost gets down to around zero. With incorporation with tillage, we get it down to that three inch depth at least. Um, that's going to minimize the, the loss of uh, applied end to volatilization. Okay, the timing. It's, it's always best to apply fertilizer, especially nitrogen, because it has so many ways to be lost, even through weed uptake. It's always best to apply it close to the peak uptake by crops, which is, you know, around early flowering in, in June, usually around Wyoming for most crops. Um, but in this case, soil texture and weather conditions might be even more important. So if you're, if you're dealing with shallow, coarse soils, 
where, um, where volatilization rates can be very high, then you want to apply it in the spring as close as possible to crop uptake. But how about cool temperatures in the fall? And you have the ability to irrigate it in. And then you know that uh, things are really going to warm up before irrigation becomes available in the spring. Well, then you might want to apply it in the fall and irrigate it in. So you, th there's a lot of things to consider like that. Those are just some examples of different scenarios. Um, there are products that inhibit uh, the hydrolysis of urea um, by inhibiting that, the activity of that urease enzyme, this NBPT contained in the product called Agritain, um, really does a good job, as you can see here, days after application, uh, Agritain can really reduce the um, loss to volatilization. There's a lot of other slow and low release um, and controlled release nitrogen products like coated urea products. So in summary, ammonia volatilization can be very costly in terms of lost and lower yields and air pollution. It's a smog producer. Uh, there's a lot of factors that contribute and a lot of these can be controlled with good management. Soil health management practices that increase soil organic matter. Now one of those is no-till, right? And reduce disturbance. So you got to consider getting it, getting the urea below the residue in that situation. But anything that increases the cation exchange by increasing soil organic matter content is going to reduce volatilization risk. Placement below the surface by tilling or banding to at least three inches or by irrigating with at least a half an inch of water is going to drastically reduce volatilization. And then considering these urease inhibitors or other products, if you, but those cost a lot and um, can increase, you know, the cost by six bucks an acre or more. So you, those should really only be considered if for some reason you have to apply urea under high risk conditions and you can't do those other management practices. So thanks very much. I look forward to any discussion and um, questions about, about this presentation. Thank you.